Section 2, Constructing Surveys. The learning objectives for this section are, one, describe the cognitive processes involved in responding to a survey item. Two, explain what a context effect is and give some examples. And three, create a simple survey questionnaire based on principles of effective item writing and organization. The heart of any survey research project is the survey itself. Although it's easy to think of interesting questions to ask people, constructing a good survey isn't easy at all. The problem is that the answers people give can be influenced in unintended ways by the wording of the items, the order of the items, the response options provided, and many other factors. At best, these influences add noise to the data. At worst, they result in systematic biases and misleading results. In this section, therefore, we consider some principles for constructing surveys to minimize these unintended effects and thereby maximize the reliability and validity of respondents' answers. Survey responding as a psychological process. Before looking at specific principles of survey construction, it'll help to consider survey responding as a psychological process. A cognitive model. Figure 7.1 presents a model of the cognitive processes that people engage in when responding to a survey item. Respondents must interpret the question, retrieve relevant information from memory, form a tentative judgment, convert the tentative judgment into one of the response options provided, such as a rating on a 1 to 7 scale, and finally edit the response as necessary. Consider, for example, the following questionnaire item. How many alcoholic drinks do you consume in a typical day? A lot more than average somewhat more than average, average, somewhat fewer than average, a lot fewer than average. Although this item at first seems straightforward, it poses several difficulties for respondents. First, they must interpret the question. For example, they must decide whether alcoholic drinks include beer and wine as opposed to just hard liquor, and whether a typical day is a typical weekday, a typical weekend day, or both. Even though Chang and Krosnick found that asking about typical behavior has been shown to be more valid than asking about past behavior, their study compared typical week to past week and may be different when considering typical weekdays or weekend days. Once respondents have interpreted the question, they must retrieve relevant information from memory to answer it. But what information should they retrieve and how should they go about retrieving it? They might think vaguely about some recent occasions on which they drank alcohol. They might carefully try to recall and count the number of alcoholic drinks they consumed last week. Or they might receive or retrieve some existing beliefs that they have about themselves, such as, I'm not much of a drinker. Then they must use this information to arrive at a tentative judgment about how many alcoholic drinks they consume in a typical day. For example, this mental calculation might mean dividing the number of alcoholic drinks they consumed last week by seven to come up with an average number per day. Then they must format this tentative answer in terms of the response options actually provided. In this case, the options pose additional problems of interpretation. For example, what does average mean? And what would count as somewhat more than average? Finally, they must decide whether they want to report the response they've come up with or whether they want to edit it in some way. For example, if they believe that they drink a lot more than average, they might not want to report that for fear of looking bad in the eyes of the researcher. So instead, they may opt to select the somewhat more than average response option. From this perspective, what at first appears to be a simple matter of asking people how much they drink and receiving a straightforward answer from them turns out to be much more complex. Context effects on survey responses. Again, this complexity can lead to unintended influences on respondents' answers. These are often referred to as context effects because they're not related to the content of the item, but to the context in which the item appears. For example, there is an item order effect when the order in which the items are presented affects people's responses. One item can change how participants interpret a later item, 
or change the information that they retrieve to respond to later items. For example, researcher Fritz Strack and his colleagues asked college students about both their general life satisfaction and their dating frequency. When the life satisfaction item came first, the correlation between the two was only negative 0.12, suggesting that the two variables are only weak, weakly related. But when the dating frequency item came first, followed by the life satisfaction item, the correlation between the two was plus 0.66, suggesting that those who date more have a strong tendency to be more satisfied with their lives. Reporting the dating frequency first made that information more accessible in memory so that they were more likely to base their life satisfaction rating on that. The response options provided can also have unintended effects on people's responses. For example, when people are asked how often they are really irritated and given response options ranging from less than once a year to more than once a month, they tend to think of major irritations and report being irritated infrequently. But when they're given response options ranging from less than once a day to several times a month, they tend to think of minor irritations and report being irritated frequently. People also tend to assume that middle response options represent what is normal or typical. So if they think of themselves as normal or typical, they tend to choose middle response options. For example, people are likely to report watching more television when the response options are centered on a middle option of four hours than when centered on a middle option of two hours. To mitigate against order effects, rotate questions and response items when there's no natural order. Counterbalancing or randomizing the order of presentation of the questions in online surveys are good practices for survey questions and can reduce response order effects that show that among undecided voters, the first candidate listed in a ballot receives a 2.5% boost simply by virtue of being listed first. Writing survey items. Types of items. Questionnaire items can either be open-ended or closed-ended. Open-ended items simply ask a question and allow participants to answer in whatever way they choose. The following are examples of open-ended questionnaire items. What's the most important thing to teach children to prepare them for life? Please describe a time when you were discriminated against because of your age. Is there anything else you would like to tell us? Open-ended items are useful when researchers don't know how participants might respond or when they want to avoid influencing their responses. Open-ended items are more qualitative in nature, so they tend to be used when researchers have more vaguely defined research questions, often in the early stages of a research project. Open-ended items are relatively easy to write because there are no response options to worry about. However, they take more time and effort on the part of the participants, and they're more difficult for the researcher to analyze because the answers must be transcribed, coded, and submit to, submitted to some form of qualitative analysis, such as content analysis. Another disadvantage is that respondents are more likely to skip open-ended items because they take longer to answer. It's best to use open-ended questions when the answer is unsure or for quantities which can easily be converted to categories later in the analysis. Closed-ended items ask a question and provide a set of response options for participants to choose from. The alcohol item just mentioned is an example, as are the following. How old are you? Under 18, 18 to 34, 35 to 49, 50 to 70, over 70. On a scale of zero, no pain at all, to 10, worst pain ever experienced, how much pain are you in right now? Have you ever in your adult life been depressed for a period of two weeks or more? Yes or no? Closed-ended items are used when researchers have a good idea of the different responses that participants might make. They're more quantitative in nature, so they're also used when researchers are interested in a well-defined variable or construct such as participants' level of agreement with some statement, perceptions of risk, or frequency of particular behaviors. Closed-ended items are more difficult to write because they must include an appropriate set of response options, 
However, they're relatively quick and easy for participants to complete. They're also much easier for researchers to analyze because the responses can be easily converted to numbers and entered into a spreadsheet. For these reasons, closed-ended items are much more common. All closed-ended items include a set of response options from which a participant must choose. For categorical variables like sex, race, or political party preference, the categories are usually listed and the participants choose the one or ones to which they belong. For quantitative variables, a rating scale is typically provided. A rating scale is an ordered set of responses that participants must choose from. Figure 7.2 shows several examples. The number of response options on a typical rating scale ranges from 3 to 11, although 5 and 7 are probably most common. Five-point scales are best for unipolar scales, where only one construct is tested, such as frequency. So never, rarely, sometimes, often, always. Seven-point scales are best for bipolar scales, where there is a dichotomous spectrum, such as liking, like very much, like somewhat, like slightly, neither like nor dislike, dislike slightly, dislike somewhat, and dislike very much. So the difference there is with the first one with frequency, they're only rating one thing from never to always. On the seven point scale, it goes in sort of two directions. They can go to the positive direction where they like the thing and they rate how much they like it, or they can go to the negative direction and say that they dislike the thing and how much they dislike it. For bipolar questions, it's useful to offer an earlier question that branches them into an area of the scale. If asking about liking ice cream, first ask, do you generally like or dislike ice cream? Once the respondents choose like or dislike, refine it by offering them relevant choices from the seven point scale. Branching improves both reliability and validity. Although you often see scales with numerical labels, it's best to only present verbal labels to respondents, but convert them to numerical values in the analyses. Avoid partial labels or lengthy or overly specific labels. In some cases, the verbal labels can be supplemented with or even replaced by meaningful graphics. The last rating scale shown in figure 7.3 is a visual analog scale on which participants make a mark somewhere along the horizontal line to indicate the magnitude of their response. What is a Likert scale? In reading about psychological research, you are likely to encounter the term Likert scale. Although this term is sometimes used to refer to almost any rating scale, such as a zero to 10 life satisfaction scale, it has a much more precise meaning. In the 1930s, researcher Rensis Likert created a new approach for measuring people's attitudes. It involves presenting people with several statements, including both favorable and unfavorable statements, about some person, group, or idea. Respondents then express their agreement or disagreement with each statement on a five-point scale. Strongly agree, agree, neither agree nor disagree, disagree, or strongly disagree. Numbers are assigned to each response and then summed across all items to produce a score representing the attitude toward the person, group, or idea. For items that are phrased in an opposite direction, for example, negatively worded statements instead of positively worded statements, reverse coding is used so that the numerical scoring of statements also runs in the opposite direction. The entire set of items came to be called a Likert scale. Thus, Unless you're measuring people's attitudes towards something by assessing their level of agreement with several statements about it, it's best to avoid calling it a Likert scale. You're probably just using a rating scale. Writing effective items. We can now consider some principles of writing questionnaire items that minimize unintended context effects and maximize the reliability and validity of participants' responses. A rough guideline for writing questionnaire items is provided by the BRUSO model. An acronym, BRUSO, stands for Brief, Relevant, Unambiguous, Specific, and Objective. 
Effective questionnaire items are brief and to the point. They avoid long, overly technical, or unnecessary words. This brevity makes them easier for respondents to understand and faster for them to complete. Effective questionnaire items are also relevant to the research question. If a respondent's sexual orientation, marital status, or income is not relevant, then items on them should probably not be included. Again, this makes the questionnaire faster to complete, but it also avoids annoying respondents with what they will rightly perceive as irrelevant or even nosy questions. Effective questionnaire items are also unambiguous. They can be interpreted in only one way. Part of the problem with the alcohol item presented earlier in this section is that different respondents might have different ideas about what constitutes an alcoholic drink or a typical day. Effective questionnaire items are also specific so that it's clear to respondents what the response should be about and clear to the researchers what it is about. A common problem here is close-ended items that are double-barreled. They ask about two conceptually separate issues, but allow only one response. For example, please rate the extent to which you have been feeling anxious and depressed. This item should probably be split into two separate items, one about anxiety and one about depression. Finally, effective questionnaire items are objective in the sense that they don't reveal the researcher's own opinions or lead participants to answer in a particular way. Table 7.2 shows some examples of poor and effective questionnaire items based on the Brousseau criteria. The best way to know how people interpret the wording of the question is to conduct a pilot test and ask a few people to explain how they interpreted the question. For closed-ended items, it's also important to create an appropriate response scale. For categorical variables, the categories presented should generally be mutually exclusive and exhaustive. Mutually exclusive categories don't overlap. For a religion item, for example, the categories of Christian and Catholic are not mutually exclusive, but Protestant and Catholic are mutually exclusive. Exhaustive categories cover all possible responses. Although Protestant and Catholic are mutually exclusive, they're not exhaustive because there are many other religious categories that a respondent might select, such as Jewish, Hindu, Buddhist, and so on. In many cases, it's not feasible to include every possible category, in which case an other category with a space for the respondent to fill in a more specific response is a good solution. If respondents could belong to more than one category, for example with race, they should be instructed to choose all categories that apply. For rating scales, five or seven response options generally allow about as much precision as respondents are capable of. However, numerical scales with more options can sometimes be appropriate. For dimensions such as attractiveness, pain, and likelihood, a zero to 10 scale will be familiar to many respondents and easy for them to use. Regardless of the number of response options, the most extreme ones should generally be balanced around a neutral or modal midpoint. An example of an unbalanced rating scale measuring perceived likelihood might look like this. Unlikely, somewhat likely, likely, very likely, extremely likely. So in that case, four of the options had likely and only one of them had it unlikely. A balanced version might look like this. Extremely unlikely, somewhat unlikely, as likely as not, somewhat likely, or extremely likely. Note, however, that a middle or a neutral response option doesn't have to be included. Researchers sometimes choose to leave it out because they want to encourage respondents to think more deeply about their responses and not simply choose the middle option by default. However, including middle alternatives on bipolar dimensions can be used to allow people to choose an option that is neither. Formatting the survey. Writing effective items is only one part of constructing a survey. For one thing, every survey should have a written or spoken introduction that serves two basic functions. One is to encourage respondents to participate in the survey. In many types of research, 
Such encouragement isn't necessary, either because participants don't know that they're in a study, such as in naturalistic observation, or because they're part of a subject pool and have already shown their willingness to participate by signing up and showing up for the study. Survey research usually catches respondents by surprise when they answer their phone, go to their mailbox, or check their email, and the researcher must make a good case for why they should agree to participate. Thus, the introduction should briefly explain the purpose of the study and its importance, provide information about the sponsor of the survey, as university-based surveys tend to generate higher response rates, acknowledge the importance of the respondent's participation, and describe any incentives for participating. The second function of the introduction is to establish informed consent. Remember that this involves describing to respondents everything that might affect their decision to participate. This includes the topics covered by the survey, the amount of time it's likely to take, the respondent's option to withdraw at any time, confidentiality issues, and so on. Written consent forms are not always used in survey research because when the research is a minimal risk, completion of the survey instrument is often accepted by the IRB as evidence of consent to participate. For this reason, it's important that this part of the introduction be well documented and presented clearly and in its entirety to every respondent. The introduction should be followed by the substantive questionnaire items, but first it's important to present clear instructions for completing the questionnaire, including examples of how to use any unusual response scales. Remember that the introduction is the point at which respondents are usually most interested and least fatigued, so it's good practice to start with the most important items for purposes of the research and proceed to less important items. Items should also be grouped by topic or by type. For example, items using the same rating scale, such as a five-point agreement scale, should be grouped together if possible to make things faster and easier for respondents. Demographic items are often presented last because they're least interesting to the participants, but they're also easy to answer in the event that respondents have become tired or bored. And of course, any survey should end with an expression of appreciation to the respondent.